Hi everyone, I, uh, I'm back with um, some more D&D &D solo play and uh, some more solo rules design. Um, so I'm still playing through um, In Search of the Unknown, uh, which is module B1, playing uh, BECMI D&D rules. Um, so what's been going on in this uh, adventure? So currently on round on turn eighteen in the uh, in the game on round uh, forty five, um, and what's basically happened um, to cut a long story short is the um, the party have just opened a, a door um, into a room um, and as soon as the door swung open uh, three small humanoid uh, small humanoids were on the uh, the other side of the door um, and they have long noses and full beards um, so the the uh, the party recognize these humanoid creatures as gnomes so there's three of them um, and they are currently inside their lair um, so yeah um, so what I've got on screen at the moment is my adventure journal this is where I record all the events um, as they unravel in my ad my solo adventures um, just need to update that there because it's turn 18 not 17 um, and I've put a little note to myself here what I do is all the kind of metagame stuff I tend to put it in square brackets uh, just so I can differentiate it and I know that this stuff here is is game narrative and this is metagame stuff um, notes to myself and uh, things that the DM might know but the players don't um so that's just a way of you know putting that information in a uh, a visual context so that i know the difference between the two you might notice that i've got a little bit of music in the background um today i'm just kind of seeing where it's like hopefully it's not too loud and distracting. And I've just realized that quite often what I do is I pause the recording. Um, you know, if I if I sort of have to think about something for a moment, I, I, I pause the, the recording. And uh, I just realized that that might make the music sound a little bit jerky. So um, hopefully that won't be... It won't be too distracting. I think what I might do is just... I might just sort of listen back to what I have um, recorded so far just to make sure that's not too distracting. And it turns out I can't <laughs> review the footage um, while a recording is paused, so... Oh, wait, actually, let me just let me just try that again. Yeah, it turns out I can review the footage. Um, it was a little bit distracting, so what I've done is I've just kind of pulled that music level down a little bit because I just wanted it to sit in the background um, underneath my voice just to, I don't know, give give it a little bit more atmosphere. Uh, I think all it's doing is encouraging me to talk a little bit louder, and I think now I've turned it down. <laughs> I'm talking ever so slightly more chilled um so right so we've got these um free gnomes one, one thing i want to do as well before i move on i just want to check that this is correct because I've, I've updated this so this is a good opportunity to show you my uh time tracker constantly trying to get the zooms right as well to make sure that um, you can see a lot of this information um, but 
sometimes I use a, a pretty small font size and that's just because um, it, it just fits better with what I'm trying to, to, to achieve with each, each page. This is my adventure sheet and I'm going to scroll down here to my time tracker. So this is where I track time in the campaign. Um, so we're on turn 18 and what I do is um, because basically these little w's are wondering monsters but in B B E C M I, the wondering monster um that's due on a, a a turn you'll roll the check and if if there is an indication that a wondering monster is going to appear it, it appears on the start of the next turn so this is a check that you make at the end of of the turn um and basically what i like to do just to make sure it all kind of lines up correctly. Because when you start the adventure, you've started round one. Um, and once that round has passed, 10 seconds have passed. So the way that I do the time is um, it's not the current turn, it's the uh, or round, it's the one before. Um, I'll show you. So basically, the current time is um, we're on turn 18, so we're three hours into the start. Um, it was 5 a.m., but we go by this. So currently, because we're doing the one before, um, it's 50 minutes into the adventure. Um, so it's, uh, sorry, two hours and 50 minutes into the adventure which would make it 7.50. And then if we look at the rounds, we're on uh, round 45. So we go the one before, 44 rounds is seven minutes and 20 seconds. I don't do the seconds, I don't track those, but I track basically hours and minutes. So it's currently 7.57. So that is correct. So the adventure journal is currently um, correct. So this brings us to the encounter tracker, which is what I use to um, manage and, and um, manage each each encounter in in the game. Um, so in the adventure journal, so we're, we're currently in an encounter with these three gnomes. Um, so I've put this information in here. I put all the statistics of the gnome in here for easy reference. That includes a, a physical description in case I need to refer to that at any point and some tactical notes about how the gnomes operate. So these gnomes prefer crossbows and warhammers and uh, they usually attack goblins on site, but at the moment there's no goblins. So um, this is how I deal with my encounters. First, I look at the initial conditions um, and I have a little um, table here with the, the procedural steps that I uh, need to follow. Um, so um, I review the monster NPC information, any special conditions arising. So that's everything up here. Um, and I update the map to show the entire area within the party line of sight. And this is where I uh, I get to show you um, something a little bit more exciting to have on the screen, um, a map. Um, so this program here is a program called um, Dungeon Scroll, which is an online app that you can use to create um, dungeon maps. And I find it really useful because, as you can see, I use a lot of digital tools um, and as I think I mentioned before, I, I tend to use digital tools um, wherever necessary. Um, and the reason why this is necessary, and I don't tend to draw these things up on paper so much at the moment, is because um, when I'm working on these solo adventures, um, I like to work on them in as many ways as possible whenever I get time. So um, if I'm sat like I am at the moment on my PC recording, um, it's much easier for me to show you something on the screen 
if I've got it on the screen. Um, I don't have a kind of handheld camera where I can show you my graph paper and stuff like that. That's something I can do in my recap videos because I can take the time to sort of draw stuff up and take photographs. But while I'm kind of playing things out on um, my PC recording like this, this is the easiest way to, to do it. Uh, and not only that, it means that I can access these maps on the go. You know, you can get Google Docs on your phone. Um, you can, you know, when I'm at, uh, on my laptop and things like that at work and I'm on a lunch break or whatever, I can play a little bit of D&D um, &D and access everything. So it's, uh, it's quite useful. Um, so coming back to the encounter tracker, um, this next procedure is um, to update the map to show the entire area within the party line of sight. Um, so the, the party's here, they're coming into this um, room and they can see these three gnomes. Um, and I've just, basically what I've done is, this is the map on uh, in the B1 module. So the party are here and this is the room. Um, but what I've done here is I've only uh, opened up what the party can actually see from their line of sight. And the way that I work this out is I just, um, you can get like a, a ruler or a tape measure or just a pencil, something straight. And you, you can just kind of, you know, produce a straight line from the party in different directions. You can see you've got the door frame would be in the way once they've opened the door. So they can't see these areas here and they can see 30 feet from their torchlight um so this is kind of what they're limited to at the moment so yeah so that's what the party are limited to in terms of what they can see um these little kind of um things here these little circles these are um, just to let me know that this is um, area within the line of sight. So they're just a marker. And these markers here, these question marks, this is to indicate that this area hasn't been mapped. And that's because um, the party actually uh, evaded a snake up here. Um, I hope you can see the arrow there. <laughs> I hope you can see the arrow. I'm, I'm, it's just to the right of these question marks. The party kind of ran down this uh, curved area, um, and they because they were um, evading, they couldn't map. <clears throat> so I've just put question marks in to indicate that. I'm still toying with how I'm going to kind of handle this from a solo perspective, because if you were playing... Um, a game at a table with a group using these old school uh, BECMI rules, um, the party just wouldn't be able to map anything at all. They'd have no idea um, how this passage curves. They would just, you know, appear down here somewhere um, and they could carry on mapping from that point. Um, and they might be able to roughly figure out how it might go, but, um, you know, I've drawn this in, but just put question marks so I know that if I ever have have to handle anything in this area again or the party need to retrace the steps, that this area won't be mapped. And I'll kind of see how that plays out and maybe come up with some rules to handle that um, in the best way possible um, to... as as best kind of capture and, and mimic um, how that would be handled in a, in a group game. So coming back to the encounter tracker, the next thing I did was I determined the surprise conditions. Here are the dice rolls. So basically both sides were surprised. And then I determined the encounter distance. Um, the gnomes are 20 feet away at the moment. Um, and then I determine the encounter direction, um, which is northeast of the party. So the gnomes are 
round about here somewhere. I really do hope you can see this arrow. <laughs> if if not, I, they're 20 feet away from the party and to the northeast side. So they're in the bottom um, right hand most square, 20 feet away from the party in this room that the party are currently facing into. Um, I think I'm going to operate under the assumption that you, that you can see this arrow <laughs> um, so that I'm not over-explaining things. And if I'm under-explaining, well, I, I'm sure that, you know, it, it won't be that difficult to to figure out what I'm, what I'm going on about. Um, so, yeah, the next thing I did was update the time tracker, which I... Yeah, I just I just noted the um, the round the turn and round number here, um, and then I just put all these results into here. So this box is basically for describing the results from what is generated here, and 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 the reason I do that is because then I can just copy and paste this information into my adventure journal once I've finished with the encounter. So it's all recorded here and the next time I have an encounter all this information will then be written over um, so that's uh, encounter stage one uh, then we move on to the encounter stage two checklist um, which is all about basically figuring out initial reactions of each side um, so the surprise round was skipped over because both parties were surprised so, um, basically, a, a round occurred where nothing actually happened. Which I have recorded here, actually. Update time tracker if both sides are surprised. So, we've gone from round 45 to round 46. Um... So then we moved on to initiative for round one, uh, and this is where a determination is made um, as to how each side reacts. So the reaction of the side with initiative, which is the party, um, I randomly rolled this. So obviously, you know, there's different trains of thought with solo games. Um, I've covered this a little bit in, in previous videos, I often switch my perspective from uh, players to DM. Um, and that's my method of avoiding um, metagaming. I kind of take myself... I take the autonomy away from um, the party at times and, and, and play the game from the perspective of a DM. And, and, and when I do that, I tend to randomly determine how the party will react um and to actually deal with that i have um some stuff down here so this is how i work out my party's reaction these are the rules i use for that so first i work out the um party level which is the total number of levels across all the characters within the current party. So we've got four characters at level one, so that's a party level of four. And the next thing I do is subtract penalties from this. Um, so that includes the total hit dice for the monsters or the level of the NPC, if uh, it's an NPC that doesn't operate with hit dice. So gnomes have uh, two hit dice, uh, I believe, um and so basically it's four with penalty subtracted which takes um the total down to two and the next thing you do is add bonuses and the first bonus is is an alignment bonus um i choose a character who's going to handle the negotiation and use their alignment so it's canis who's neutral and the gnomes are also neutral so um, that gives an alignment bonus of two. So basically, um, the way this bonus is worked out is if, if the alignment is the same, the bonus is plus two. 
if the alignment is different, it's zero. If it's opposite, it's minus two. So um, different means it's not the same alignment, but it's not the opposite alignment, if that makes sense. And then the charisma bonus is added here, and Canis has a charisma of 14, so he gets a plus one bonus. So if you subtract the penalties and add the bonuses, the total reaction bonus for the party is five. Then I roll 2d6 on this table here um, to figure out what the party are going to do. I rolled uh, a six and added five, which is 11. So that means the party are going to communicate. Uh, and then I've put a note here, refer to the encounter phase column of the character dialogue table. So this is a table in my rule set, which I will find in here. So um, right down at the bottom, this is just getting bigger and bigger and it's getting harder and harder for me to find where it is I'm looking for. I'm probably writing the same rule twice in 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 areas because it's it's just evolving more and more um but uh this would be under character role playing uh which is here um character dialogue within the encounter phase is the table here um so i rolled on this table uh and i should have my results up here um, yeah, so the party wanted to communicate and um, the next roll I made reduced a result of Lur into service. Um, so the party are, are trying to Lur. So what's happening at the moment, and, and the reason I've highlighted this in yellow is because this is where I currently am in game. I'm using my encounter tracker and I'm handling this negotiation here. So the party... Um, want to attempt to lure the uh, gnomes into their service. And currently a, a 30... Um, hang on, let me just check this. So the rules I used here, lure into service. I'll read these out. These are rules that I've written, and this is my solo rule book. So to lure any number of monsters or NPCs into service... A reward must be offered by a player character or requested by the monster or NPC. To stand a good chance of bringing monsters or NPCs into service, the reward offered should be equal to the gold coin column of the inlay treasure value multiplied by 10 for the monster or the character type. So this refers to a table in the treasure section of the rule cyclopedia. Um, each monster has a treasure type. Um, they Well, they have two. One corresponds to um, their treasure type in the lair and one corresponds to the treasure type um, outside of the lair. Um, and these gnomes are in the lair, so their treasure type is C, according to the rule cyclopedia. Uh, oh no, sorry, is it C? I, I'll double check, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to open my rule cyclopedia. So I have the rule cyclopedia open, and I want to find... Gnomes. I believe that's the in the rule section. Monsters. Monster list. And the, annoyingly, it doesn't break it down any further than that. Um, so this PDF I bought from uh, the DMs Guild. It's probably on... It'll be on drive through RPG as well. Um, I also have a print-on-demand copy, which is, is really good, but I hope to to get hold of the proper rule cyclopedia one day. It's just living in the UK, it's quite hard to get hold of a lot of the old um, BC, BECMI stuff without having to pay quite a lot of money. It's not something that I would find in a secondhand bookshop over here. And if, if a charity shop or a secondhand shop had the book, I can guarantee they would put it behind glass and they would charge 
possibly more than what you'd pay for on eBay, which is really annoying. Uh, but it's just the way it is in the UK because um, I guess D and D was. I, I think it wasn't as popular over over in Europe as it was in the States. Um, so a lot of this stuff is really rare. It's hard to find. Um, so I'm going to search for um, gnomes. And I'm going to have to do it this way, which is really annoying uh, with certain types of monsters because um, there'll be a lot of entries all over the book um, that refers to the monster. So it's hard to find their stat. Uh, the stat block. So the treasure type. I think the brackets one is in there. Let me just check. No, it's not. Oh, I'm going to have to look even deeper here. <laughs> no, it's right. So this is the treasure that's found in the layer and this is the treasure. The P is the treasure that's found carried. Um, so back to this. So we're on C. So right, okay. I'm going to roll because basically I've messed this up here, this 30 electron pieces. I mean, it's because I rolled and then I decided to switch the... Because I wanted everything in, in this table to be gold pieces. Um, and it's basically, it's not that that's the offer that's got to be made, that the offer that has to be made has got to be equal in value to that amount in gold pieces. So 1d2 is basically 1d4 half. So I'm going to try and find a d4 in my dice. D4's always being the hardest dice to find when you've got a tin of, of dice. I should really try and separate the different dice. I haven't got enough dice to to really kind of um, validate separating them out. But I'm sure I probably will one day because it's fun buying dice for some reason. So I've rolled a d4. I got two. So half that's one times 10 is 10 gold pieces um which is not a lot really so back to my encounter tracker so the offer required has got to be equal to 10 10 gold pieces so back to my rules now So if, if sufficient funds are not available or PCs do not want to give away anything up front, there are two options, haggle or promise to pay. Um, let's see, do the party have enough treasure? I mean, they have their individual money carried and this is the treasure they've acquired so far. Which isn't a great amount, um, really. So parting with 10 gold pieces is not really... <laughs> it's not really going to be the best thing to do. <laughs> um, so I think that... I guess they're much more likely to try and haggle. Or the other option is to promise to pay the reward later. So let's have a look at that option. Rewards paid later will usually be a share of any treasure acquired during the adventure. This share will be based on a percentage as followed. So do I want to offer these gnomes a percentage? Um to bring them along. I guess the question I need to to ask myself here is um, 
would it be worth the party's while? Would would having three gnomes along who are of neutral alignment, so they're the same alignment as the, as the party leader, um, would what are the risks and what are the benefits um, to this? I mean, I guess I could sit here all day and and and, and really kind of. Um, sort of draw up the pros and cons um which would be a little bit quite time consuming but it could be interesting it could be interesting some questions straight off the bat would be you know what do the party know about gnomes do they know enough that they can trust um forming a um an understanding uh, um an alliance with them so there's that to consider. Um, you know what? What do they bring to the the party, uh, and does that outweigh the risks? It, it it all kind of boils down to how much the party know about gnomes, and this is something that hasn't been um, pre um, kind of determined before the game started. So we're entering an area where there is. Uh, an opportunity here to um, figure this out in in an elegant way, um, something that has not that is not already uh, known beforehand, and and I guess like anything with with solo play, when you go into that, you want to do it in a way that um, you're not kind of giving unfair advantages. You 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 know you're keeping. The integrity um, there when these things are kind of um, sussed out. On the other hand, if the party decide to haggle, um, then there is the obvious risk of the offer being rejected. Um, and then who knows what m that might result in. So I've definitely got an opportunity here to develop some more um, solo rules around how to handle a situation where the party are trying to lure um, a monster or an NPC into service. They do have sufficient funds, but those funds... Uh, you know, it's going to be a large chunk of what they've got available. And, um, you know, is that worth it? Because if they're here to score treasure, um, which is one of the most popular pastimes in, in old school D&D, &D, they don't want to be giving away treasure every time they meet a monster. Um, so they've decided they want to communicate and they want to come to a, an understanding and bring them into service. But... Um, despite having enough money, that might not be the best way forward. So that leaves haggling, uh, and also leads it also leaves um, promising to pay the reward later. So I think the best way to handle this is come up with a method of kind of determining which solution will be most likely, and that will be based on, I guess, maybe the party's intelligence. It will be based on. Um, how much spare funds they do have and how much this is going to eat into them. Uh, and maybe, you know, some roles to determine how much they know about the creature, how much that creature can be trusted, what are the, the benefits of that creature being in the party. So I've got a lot of thinking to do here. And I think, you know, um, this is something where... It, it, I'll, I'll need to kind of go away and really sit down and have a, a think about how to handle this before I handle it. Um, so what I'm going to say at this point to anyone who's watching the video, um, have a think too, because a few people... Uh, have been sending their suggestions in comments and I think that's been really useful and I've I've quite enjoyed that and um, I I do know a lot of the things that are said down 
um, for future consideration so that when I revisit a rule uh, and I'm applying it again, I think, actually, can I improve this? And what what did people think of this? Um, what what have people said about it? And, and see if I can improve on, on what I came up with um, based on feedback I've received because plenty of people uh, are going to have um, different ideas, uh, different approaches. So that would be really useful. So, you know, if you have a good idea, then stick it in the in the comments. And most likely I'll have come up with something before I, I get around to reading those comments. But... Um, but still, it, it's a, an exercise so, um, that might be fun, you know, seeing how those different ideas differ. So, yeah, go ahead and, and do that. I think um, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to pause this. Um, you know, in this video, I guess I've covered a little bit of explanation as to how I handle encounters, um, more non-combat negotiations, that involve uh, luring monsters into service. And I guess this will be kind of like almost like a part one. And then there'll be a, a part two, which will get into kind of more rules as to how I'll handle the next the next bit, which is going to be what what is the party going to do? What decision are they going to make? Um, so hopefully I will see you then in the next video. So thanks for watching. Um, and I'll see you in the next session.